Children should be seen and not heard, said parents in Queen Victoria's time. But many of these children, now grown up, were to enjoy a type of music that must definitely be heard rather than seen. So almost all the performers to be mentioned here can be heard and often seen simply by typing their names into Google. Pens and pencils ready? Let's begin. When Rudy Blesch published his pioneering history of jazz in 1946, he called it Shining Trumpets. Why not wailing saxes or thrumming banjos, screaming clarinets or rhythmic drums? And there were no trumpets played by the founding fathers of jazz, the cornet reigned supreme. But Blesch realised that trumpets have symbolism. They herald the arrival of exciting events with stirring tones and thrilling promises. We shall investigate whether these promises were fulfilled during the development of jazz and dance music in the first 50 years of the 20th century. And this will involve an examination of the music's role in societies on both sides of the pond. To set the stage, during the 1800s, the regular exchange of entertainers across the pond was not a novelty. Most went east to west and consisted of Italian opera and French ballet troops. When the composer Offenbach conducted his first concert in New York's Gilmore Gardens in 1876, it attracted a crowd of 5,000. But more than a third left after the first number and few remained until the end. They'd expected a can-can display and only got an orchestral concert. The comic operas of Gilbert and Sullivan were incredibly popular in the States, from the production two years later in 1876 of HMS Pinafore in Boston, unofficially as there was no reciprocal copyright law with the UK. Attempting to outwit these theatrical pirates, Gilbert and Sullivan's next offering, The Pirates of Penzance, was actually premiered in New York. Even so, in 1886, no fewer than five unauthorised Mikado companies were touring the country. Traffic from west to east across the pond was less common. So when, in 1913, the review Hello Ragtime was presented at the London Hippodrome, it made a huge impact. Ragtime was initially a type of piano music, characterised by a syncopated melody in the right hand and a steady rhythmic accompaniment in the left that threw the right hand syncopations into relief. Syncopation was one of the elements essential to jazz and it was the element that particularly excited those experiencing it for the first time. It was, after all, previously quite rare in popular music. The lyrics demonstrate the difference. Here, from the 1899 British show Floridora, is the opening line of the hit number. Tell me, pretty maiden, are there any more at home like you? Here is the opening line of the 1911 hit, Alexander's Ragtime Band. Come on and hear, come on and hear, Alexander's Ragtime Band. The word jazz was known in Britain since at least 1917, but what it meant was unclear in many people's minds. Various American entertainers had crossed the pond and there were references to jazz in some of their songs, but all was not singing and performers like the Little Fields, who advertised their act as jazzing on a wobbly wire, had led some to come to the conclusion that jazz was perhaps a kind of dance. And to those aware of the actual source of the word jazz, this was not totally wide of the mark. In 1970, London music publishers Francis Day and Hunter issued When I Hear That Jazz Band Play, and later in the year, the Jazz Boys appeared at London's Metropolitan Theatre, Edgware Road. They were writers and composers of My Jazz Band Down in Dixieland. A reviewer wrote approvingly of their performance that 
the audience was convulsed with amusement. Where was Gypsyland? There are several possible origins of this designation of the southern states of the US. The most likely is probably the result of the strong French influence, particularly in Louisiana, which we'll shortly explore in more detail. The ten dollar notes issued there showed ten on one side and the French translation D, D, I, X on the other. On the 19th of January 1919, the Times of London printed the word jazz for the first time in connection with the show then running at a West End theatre, where unusually the drummer was singled out for special mention. Not the least interesting feature of a capital programme this week at the Coliseum, wrote the reviewer, is the effort of the orchestra to convert itself into a jazz band, one of the many American peculiarities that threaten to make life a nightmare. The object of a jazz band, apparently, is to provide as much noise as possible. The reporter then describes the drummer's traps. Around him there are as many things as he can possibly need. Motor horns, bells, sheets of tin, anything from which noise can be extracted. The object of the drummer then it seems seems to be to strike as many things as possible in the shortest space of time. Three months later, on the 7th of April 1919, an American band announcing itself as creators of jazz arrived in London. This, the original Dixieland jazz band, would surely allow their British audiences to have a genuine experience of the new music. But it raises the question of what is jazz? Made in America, Webster's Dictionary should provide the answer. Here is Webster's comprehensive second definition of jazz, the first being copulation, generally considered vulgar. American music developed from religious and secular songs as spiritual shout songs, blues, ragtime and other popular music as brass band marches, and characterised by improvisation, syncopated rhythms, contrapuntal ensemble playing, special melodic features as flatted notes, blue notes, peculiar to the individual interpretation of the player, and the introduction of vocal techniques as portamento into instrumental performance. Why is jazz an American music? Well, it had to have its roots in a newfound land because it was only in such a place that there would be the necessary convergence of the disparate elements, a place where immigrants from different cultures could meet and meld. In America, that newfound land, the early immigrants to the north were from Northern Europe, Britain, Holland, Scandinavia, Germany, often Puritans or religious refugees. To the southern states, the Europeans came from Spain, Portugal and France. Soon populations in both northern and southern states were to rapidly increase with the arrival of stays from West Africa. But there were differences in the attitudes to these unwilling newcomers by the existing immigrant populations because of the residents' own different cultures. These were particularly marked in the deep southern states of Louisiana, bounded by the Gulf of Mexico and the mighty Mississippi. Louisiana was initially French, then Spanish, then French again for a brief period until becoming one of the United States. However, the French influence was strong, including the Code Noir, which was applied in all French colonies and gave slaves more rights and privileges than they had elsewhere in the USA. And for their part, the Spanish had introduced La Siete Partidas, the Seven Protections, and slaves were allowed to marry, a mother and her children could not be separated, nor could married couples, and if they agreed to be instructed in the Catholic faith, slaves were in general accepted as people rather than possessions. Furthermore, since Roman times, manumission, under which slaves might sometimes be given or might purchase their freedom, had been practised in Spain and Portugal. <laughs> 
The French influence also grew through the export of comfort women to this part of the world where gentlemen outnumbered ladies. These were emigrants convicted of easy virtue, who often then married French settlers. Now, those who know Puccini's Manon Lescaut will remember that in the last act, the disgraced heroine, banished from France via convict ship, dies in a desolate plain of New Orleans. It's clear how the conditions for much of Webster's definition of jazz were set to be fulfilled in New Orleans, the most important city and port of Louisiana. The Spanish had introduced a half holiday for slaves on Sunday afternoons and they were free to socialise in an area of the city which became known as Congo Square. Here, until the Civil War, they would play music, sing and dance. In New Orleans, wealthy slave owners followed French social customs, with balls and other functions where music was provided by dance bands of a type familiar in Western Europe. The typical instrumentation was violin, cornet, clarinet, trombone, double bass, guitar or banjo and drums. In 1865 the Confederate army was defeated, the southern states capitulated and the slaves were freed. They formed their own brass bands influenced by French military bands while the instrumentation of the New Orleans jazz band was modelled on the European dance band. A plaster and semi-professional cornet player named Buddy Bolden had, by 1895, become leader of his own six-piece dance band. He enlivened his melodic lead by ragging, a style derived from the ragtime pianist's syncopated right-hand melodies. Although his playing career lasted only about 12 years before he was admitted to a mental hospital for the remainder of his life, he was influential on a number of other New Orleans cornet players who achieved later fame. As the Covid pandemic has reminded us, musicians are not free from the effects of external events. In the 1930s, the advent of sound films is estimated to have cost the jobs of some 12 to 15,000 cinema musicians in Britain alone. Something similar occurred in 19th century New Orleans in the Storyville district, which had long been the entertainment area of the city. Here, work was plentiful for musicians in the many cabarets and sporting houses. There had been half-hearted attempts to close these down by the city fathers, but it took an edict from the United States Naval Authorities in Washington in 1918 to finalise the closure, causing many musicians to trek or work their way on Mississippi River boats north to Chicago. One of the most distinguished of these was Joseph King Oliver, a greatly respected cornet player leader of the Creole dance band and renowned for novel and muted effects. In 1922, he invited the young Louis Armstrong to join the band as second cornet, giving the band a very distinctive sound. Armstrong was shortly to form his own band and be in the forefront of those who took up trumpet, expanding the expressive possibilities of the instrument through now familiar techniques like the half valve, the smear, lip trill and rip. While King Oliver's two cornet section may have been an early indication of a tendency to increase the size of bands, the most important effect of the influx of jazz musicians from New Orleans was on Chicago musicians themselves. Musicians whose sights were often set even farther afield, which takes us back to the 7th of April 1919. The London show, in which the ODJB appeared, was produced by Albert de Courville, who regularly imported theatrical performers from America. The band's appearance was simply one of the turns in the course of an evening's entertainment, which, in essence, was not all that different from musical shows of a few years earlier. Harry Brum, in his book The Story of the Original Dixieland Jazz Band, describes how the ovation following the opening number was deafening, due in large part to the number of American doughboys in the audience. He continues, 
The fever spread throughout the theatre until every last man and woman was on his feet, shouting and clapping in a manner that was peculiarly un-British. When the curtain came down, George Roby, the star comedian of the show, strode up to de Corville in a seething rage and served an ultimatum. Roby or the jazz band would have to go. De Corville could have his pick. De Corville gave in. The show, minus jazz, ran for another 722 performances, while the ODJB arranged a fortnight at the Palladium, followed by appearances at various clubs, and a command performance at Buckingham Palace to an audience of royalty and aristocracy. Nicola Rocker, who led the band on Cornet, later wrote that the nobility peered at the band through their lorgnettes as though we had bugs on us. After the band played their renowned version of Tiger Wag, King George V laughed his approval and began to applaud energetically, followed immediately by his loyal entourage of sycophants. The King's musical discretion had been clearly registered in one of his earlier diary entries, which read, Went to Covent Garden and saw Fidelio and damn dull it was a conclusion with which some others might agree. An eight-month season at a popular dance hall in West London, the Hammersmith Palais, allowed the ODJB to play for a genuinely appreciative audience. Dancers, rather than people sitting in serried rows expecting a variety term. Dancing is the most natural outcome of music, which is the reason for those tapping feet you see out of the corner of your eye when you're trying to concentrate on playing. Recordings of the ODJB show the band's spirited, somewhat jerky style, with limited improvisation, lots of funny noises and incessant trombone glissandi. Very effective at getting the feet moving. This was music for those fortunate enough to have come through the Great War and easing a release. Before the band sailed back to America in June 1920, they recorded 20 numbers for the British Columbia Company, having earlier made the first jazz recordings in history in the States. Even though this band wasn't the originator of jazz, it was something arguably almost as important. It confirmed the template of the three-man front line of cornet or trumpet, melodic lead, and the clarinet's decorative arpeggios, both supported by the trombone, which often also provided a link with the rhythm section, usually guitar or banjo, piano, bass and drums. Much as with a classical orchestra, this could be expanded at will of the composer, arranger, leader or impresario. Prior to 1914, Britain had been living in its Edwardian age of opulence, with the security provided by its enormous empire, on which the sun never set. But after the shock of the so-called Great War, the Twenties were to be a total contrast. There is nothing more poignant than the letters that the leading British composer, Sir Edward Elgar, wrote to his publishers after the war. Before, he'd made a good living from the sheet music world he's earned from popular pieces like Chanson de Matin. He was now completely unable to understand why nobody was buying them, nobody was playing them, nobody wanted to hear them. But the public had changed, and the music had to change also. If Elgar's salon pieces had typified popular music before the war, jazz, of whatever kind, was destined to become the popular music of the immediate aftermath. There were, however, still plenty of people on both sides of the pond, particularly older people and especially older music lovers, who would not agree with the word popular mainly because they'd been shocked by a situation which, like Elgar, they could not comprehend. In 1921, the town of Zion, Illinois, banned jazz performances on the ground that they were sinful. It should perhaps be added that until 1940, the town enshrined the Flat Earth Doctrine in its religious code, so there may be something that needs further investigation here. In 1925, the London Evening News headed an item, 
just because a Marylebone defendant today was described as a jazz musician. Mr. Freak Palmer, solicitor. He is one who makes those filthy noises at dances. Mr. Hay Holker, magistrate. I agree. It is not music. Mr. Freak Palmer. And he plays the saxophone, which is the worst instrument of the lot. Mr. C.V. Hill, solicitor. I heartily agree that they are horrible noises. But there were exceptions to the attitudes of Mr. Freak and his colleagues. One of them, the conductor Ernest Ansemé, who founded the renowned Orchestra de la Suisse Gourmande and became an advocate of Stravinsky's music. In 1919, when in London, he heard an American group called the Southern Syncopated Band. He praised its astonishing perfection, the superb taste and the fervour of its playing. Their form was gripping, abrupt and harsh, with a brusque and pitiless ending like that of Bach's second Brandenburg concerto. Pause for thought. The clarinetist, later to become famous for his soprano saxophone playing, was Sidney Bechet, and Anthony May remarked that his way is perhaps the highway the whole world will swing along tomorrow a common prescient in its use of the word swing. This is, and always has been, an essential element of jazz, along with improvisation and syncopation. As Ella Fitzgerald authoritatively sang, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Although swing is impossible to describe, it is immediately apparent something of which the proprietors of Abbott's Jazz School at 215 Kensington High Street in 1921 were clearly unaware. It can't be taught. It can only be felt and, if you're a would-be jazz musician, hopefully absorbed. On January the 1st, 1920, the London Evening Standard stated that the new year had been welcomed in the capital with a rattle of jazz drums and a frenzy of syncopation. It brought the good news that the jazz age had arrived. But Wiser Heads might have commented, it ain't necessarily so. Here was more confusion, this time between jazz and syncopated dance music, which was widespread by 1920. This confusion was felt on both sides of the pond. The instrumentation of jazz and dance music was similar and each had a steady pulsating beat. So to the press and to record companies they were the same thing. The British band leader Jack Hilton was described in the press as variously the British King of Jazz and the Ambassador of British Dance Music. When his band played waltzes in 1921, the record company Zonophone still called it a jazz band, while in the HMV catalogue, the ODJB went into the dance section. As the 1920s progressed, jazz was heard in many more places than big cities, both via the gramophone and also the exciting new medium of wireless. The first crystal set had appeared in 1901. For those of you too young to remember, a crystal set consisted of a short length of fine wire called a cat's whisker, which was used to prod a small lump of mineral crystal. The speech or music thus received through the ether was then amplified through headphones. Sounds crude, but here is the basis of broadcasting. In 1920, a radio ham in Pittsburgh started to play gramophone records through the wireless to his friends who received the broadcast in their homes. By the following year, there were three commercial radio stations in the USA, a number which by the end of 1922 had increased to over 500. Technically savvy residents in the UK could sometimes tune into jazz being broadcast in America on their own homemade wireless sets. Here was a major step in this music's becoming universal. It was just as well for Brits. It hasn't been possible to discover the date of the first jazz broadcast by the BBC. 
The first relay of dance music from London's Castle Hotel was on the 24th of May 1923, but it took the Second World War before the BBC's severely Calvinistic director General Sir John Reith allowed even light music into the nation's homes on Sundays. Back in 1920, the ODJB found that many things had changed when they returned to America. Bands like Paul Whiteman had appeared on the scene. Whiteman had established his first dance band in San Francisco in 1918 and settled in New York two years later. In contrast to the ODJB's cornet, clarinet, trombone, piano and drums, Whiteman, who had been a viola player in the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra, waved a large baton in front of an orchestra photographed in 1923 with 14 players. By 1924, it was stated that on gala occasions this had grown to eight violins, flute, a saxophone section plus clarinets and oboes, two trumpets, two trombones, two horns, banjo, piano and two sousaphones, doubling string bass. The sousaphone was important, as this was still an age without amplification, except perhaps a megaphone for the relatively rare vocalist, and the essential bass part could scarcely be provided by one plucked acoustic double bass. The brass bass had been growing in importance as an essential component for some years. While this bulky lineup might seem to present overwhelming odds to anyone trying to get a band to swing, this was not really the Whiteman band's main function. But Whiteman, who styled himself King of Jazz, did have some talented jazzmen amongst his personnel, including the unique cornetist Bix Beiderbeck. A truly innovative musician, while others might have changed to trumpet, he remained loyal to the cornet which he enlivened by techniques like unconventional fingering, using a higher slot with a longer valve tube length and producing a different intonation and timbre from normal. His four compositions for piano were a true just feeling with Debussy and harmonies, the result of a wide awareness of contemporary musical idioms. Clearly, jazz was becoming more confident and perhaps more mature as a member of the wider musical world. In Britain too, an increase in the size of bands was noticeable. Like Paul Whiteman's, these big bands, as they came to be known, often provided regular employment for jazz musicians, a practice set to continue. It was significant that the basic principle of cornets, clarinet and trombone plus rhythm section was still maintained, although individuals had now become complete sections of brass and reeds, often used antiphonally. The big bands sometimes gave their jazz musicians the opportunity to play an improvised solo, although only jazz bands had put the stress on the word band. King Oliver a greatly respected leader in New Orleans had emphasised, I mean I want you to be a bandman, and a bandman only, and do all you can for the welfare of the band in the line of playing your best at all times. But it was inevitable that outstanding instrumentalists would appear. Bix Beiderbeck had been allowed the occasional solo in the Whiteman band, and Louis Armstrong, who joined Fletcher Henderson's band in New York in 1924, was taken on as the jazz specialist. Although he left at the end of the following year, his influence had been so strong, the band rapidly changed character and by 1926 had a high reputation for its jazz. Armstrong went on to form his own remarkable drumless Hot Five and then his Hot Seven. The latter did include a drummer plus the tuba player Pete Briggs. Initially, brass sections in the bigger bands consisted of two trumpets and one trombone. But in 1927, Fletcher Henderson added a second trombone, followed by Duke Ellington in 1929. Ellington expanded his section in the 1930s to three trumpets and three trombones, while later, during the 1940s, a brass section of four trumpets and four trombones would become standard. Britain tended to follow in America's footsteps, not least because that is what listeners and dancers expected. <laughs> 
Many of the best tunes came from Broadway shows or movies that had crossed the pond. During the 1920s, styles of social dancing changed from the smooth foxtrot, introduced back in 1914 and then often danced to a steady ragtime tempo, to the Charleston, with its very distinctive start-stop rhythm, introduced in the show Running Wild in 1923. Adopting the same rhythm, the Black Bottom, from George White's Scandals of 1926, became even more popular. These dances were not only lively, but often became quite wild. This was the 1920s. On his first visit to London in 1932, Louis Armstrong played in an amazingly similar environment to that of the ODJB 13 years earlier, a variety bill at the Palladium where he was accompanied by a hastily assembled British band. The visit of Duke Ellington's superb orchestra, with its sits brass, the following year, also opening at the Palladium, was a triumph, and the first of many more visits. It may have been an inevitable reaction, but during the 1930s and 40s, a decidedly smoother and perhaps more sophisticated style of music became popular, often known simply as swing. The American trombonist band leader Tommy Dorsey, who played the White Man Band and recorded alongside Vix Baldebeck, became famous for his precise and smooth ballad performances, typified in his recording of the theme tune I'm Getting Sentimental Over You. Frank Sinatra once stated that he'd learned everything he knew about phrasing breath control from listening to the way Tommy Dorsey played trombone. Glenn Miller was another native trombonist, band leader and arranger. The riff, a repeated figure, had become pervasive in many big bands and here it was often all but carried to extremes. Miller often scored for muted brass with much use of the derby or hat mute. His fame spread throughout Europe during the Second World War when his Army Air Force band was posted to England from where it broadcast regularly. Its clarinet lead over saxophones and a muted brass sound were very distinctive, whether gently swinging or more driving. Major Glenn Miller died in a flight across the English Channel on the 15th of December 1942. His body has never been found. By the early 1940s there were reactions in some quarters to the big bands. One of them took the form of bebop, exploiting harmonies new to jazz, irregular phrase lengths and evenly played fast notes. For the first time since the New Orleans brass bands, vowel trombones appeared, until the remarkable duo of J.J. Johnson and Kai Vinding demonstrated it was possible to play slide trombone just as rapidly. Trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie showed the influences of both Armstrong through his mentor Roy Eldridge and saxophonist Charlie Parker, arguably Bop's most important exponent. To many, Dizzy was most identifiable through his trumpet's bell, upturned through an angle of 45 degrees. Impressionable wannabes followed suit, not realising their idol's horn was that way because he'd once sat on it. Another bop trumpeter, Miles Davis, escaped to become a leading exponent of the Cool School. He also had been a member of Charlie Parker's quintet, subsequently leading his own group, but then abruptly turning to the approach pioneered in the 1940s by the Claude Thornhill Band, which unusually included French horn and tuba. Here, no vibrato was used, tone colours were soft, and the music at times appeared almost static. In 1954, Miles Davis introduced a unique trumpet sound, playing with a harmon mute without a stem close to the microphone. With a range of and backings that sometimes included 12 brass, his notes seem at times to be implied rather than stated. But how this style, even so, can truly swing is demonstrated in recordings like Porgy and Bess, Sketches of Spain, and the 1957 Miles Ahead, in which his use of flugelhorn was influential on pretty well all later jazz trumpet players.
A very different development in the 1940s was the revival of New Orleans-style jazz, in a sense anticipating the early music movement in Western classical music of 20 years later. In the US, this was called Dixieland. In Britain, it was trad, traditional. The clang of the banjo was heard throughout the land, glissandi were profuse, and a tuba always underpinned the rhythm section. Meanwhile, dance halls were operating six days a week, their versatile bands offering smooth, slow foxes, Latin American dances, and even occasionally allowed to indulge in an actual big band jazz number to accompany a quick step. Although there were often notices on the wall stating, no jiving allowed. Those jiving could sometimes get inspired to improvise even more athletic moves than in the Charleston's dance by their parents. Unusually, a British big band achieved success in both sides of the Atlantic in the 1950s, with trombonist band leader Ted Heath employing outstanding arrangements of leading jazzmen to produce between them a tightly organised driving sound. Writing in 1994, veteran Manchester band leader Phil Moss declared, the 1950s were the golden years for the Manchester bands and musicians. This was true not only for Manchester. Mecca dancing alone ran dance halls from London to Glasgow, Southampton to Burnley, all with resident big bands. And at the same time, every pub in the country with a back room had a jazz club where enthusiastic amateur traddies played and their enthusiastic fans listened and, if there was space, jived. On the other side of the jazz divide there were fewer venues, but distinguished tennis sats man Ronnie Scott's club for modern jazz opened in London Soho in 1959 and is in full swing still. Here, many distinguished American players were to make their British debuts. United States Air Force camps established in the UK during World War II gave opportunities for troops, who were also jazzmen, to sit in with admiring Brits playing gigs. During the 1950s, other British jazzmen heard Americans on their home turf by means of crossing the pond as members of ship's bands. Trad icon Ken Collier did it via the Merchant Navy and jumping ship for a Greyhound bus to his Mecca, New Orleans. Versatile pianist Dill Jones expelled from Trinity College for playing jazz on the organ in the room above the principal's office, sailed off to New York and built a successful career there. But as the 1960s approached, unexpected events were occurring in British trad jazz. With increasing popularity, it began to be heard and seen in larger venues, attracting larger audiences and wider interest. The traddies and the boppers shared no common ground. In fact, they found nothing in common at all. Martin Jazz was quite candid about becoming more intellectual, some might have said pretentious, while the more basic the trad was, the more genuine it was considered to be by its fans. The first trad band to enter the UK charts was Chris Barber's in 1959. The last was Akabilk in 1963. In December 1962, a rock group from Liverpool called The Beatles had entered the charts in both Britain and the States, which they were occupied for a long time. Although rock and jazz come from the same roots, jazz was destined to rapidly become a minority interest. It became apparent that jazz was gravitating towards either tribute, homage or recreation, or was influenced to a greater extent by other musical idioms. Brass was now involved to a relatively limited extent. Having said that, Sixty years later, pre-Covid big band jazz and dance music were being not only kept alive, but enjoyed universally in bands whose members played simply for love of their art. And these same dedicated musicians were equally keen to pass on their commitment and enjoyment to young people appreciating this great music. How appropriate that jazz and dance music should now, in 2021, 
be both under consideration by members of an organisation involved in historical musicology and also, as we shall hear, being kept alive by enthusiastic young musicians. Thank you so much for listening. I do hope you managed to endure it. And if you enjoyed it, I hope that you managed to enjoy it as well.